Hey guys, welcome to the Talk of Fame podcast. Today is such an exciting episode on the podcast. As per usual, all episodes are exciting, but this one I'm especially excited for because we have Dr. Kristen Eccleston, who is joining us today. Kristen is doing so many things, such as being an award-winning education consultant, keynote speaker, published author, and mental health thought leader, currently living and work in the DMV, which is D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. Um, her er- areas are focused on education, consultant, our K-12, and cons- com- corporate mental health and neurodiversity engagement. As an educa- education consultant, she has worked with thousands of students and families, in addition to some of the major global managing consultant firms. After more than 15 years in a school setting, Dr. Ecclesi left classroom teaching significantly have an impact on mental health and neurodiversity, which approaches in schools and workplace settings. In 2022, Dr. Lustin was selected as one of women-led magazine's leaders shaping women's entrepreneurship's future. In August 2022, she participated in season five, The Box, which is the largest competition TV show on the planet for startups. I always say to people that I I do great stuff, but, you know, look at you, Kristen. You're absolutely killing it. Thank you so much for coming on the Talk of Fame podcast. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. I feel really, really honored, and thank you for such a wonderful intro. I feel like, wow, I I didn't even realize I've been doing so many things. It's probably my ADHD. I should probably take it down a level. (laughs) Yeah, same here. Like, sometimes I'll be like, I take so many things, and I, like, overthink, I'm like, why am I taking over so many things? Like, it's like, the the one feeling they're like, I love what I do, but why am I taking on this many stuff? Is a yes. I, I often forget to pump my brakes a little bit and realize that I can't do all the things that I want to do. Uh, but I get so many ideas in my head all the time. I'm sure you have that happen too. And then you're like, I've got to do all the ideas. Yeah, I deal with so many ideas every single day. That I'm like, I always say I'm always exhausted. At the same time, I'm like, I have so many ideas. I want to get it done. Like, it's just like so many ideas. But I'm like... How am I supposed to manage this one if I can't manage the schedule I already have right now at the moment? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but well, like, how is, you know, teaching college students, you know, different from K-12 students? Like, I know you teach both of them, but of course, like, like both of the levels are two different things, of course. But how are, you know, from your experience, teaching college students different from teaching K-12 students? That's a really good question. And honestly, I think what it comes down to is maybe maturity levels. I don't know that I, I've always been either a middle school, high school teacher when I was teaching K through 12. And when I teach adults, you know, I think the, the energy is different in the sense that I can maybe be a little bit more bold with my jokes or a little bit more inappropriate at times when I'm joking about things versus when you're in a K through 12 setting, you have to be very careful about what you say and how you present things. Um, so I feel like that's probably my biggest difference, but as far as like the energy that I, I give out or the commitment that I have, or just wanting to make the learning aspect fun, I don't know that I have a huge difference between in how I teach K through 12 versus how I teach college students. I will say I try to be a little bit more flexible with college students in the sense that a lot of them are um, either working full time or have other family commitments. Uh, So sometimes I'm just a little bit more flexible than I am with some of my K-12 students, even though I I like to think of myself as a cool, flexible teacher. Uh, But I think it's just like the energy um, and and how far I take my joking. I like to be a fun teacher. I like it to make it feel like when you come to my class, you enjoy coming to my class. I think we've all had teachers where we're like, why do I have to go to that person's class today? And I don't want people to feel like that when I'm teaching. So I really just try to give a lot of energy and a lot of fun to how I'm presenting things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like what you said, like there's always that one teacher that you're in school, you're like, why well, do I have to go to person's class? And I'm like, I am literally ha- am that person that always says, well, why do I have to go to this person's class? I just want to switch classes. But mm-hmm. at the same time, like you said, like college and K for 12 is so different than, you know, college levels. Because of course, people are working full time jobs. Even with um having in high school, kids still work from like um part time job straight from school, don't have time to do homework or sports events or whatever it is they both have you know similarities but of course the maternity levels and the way people act is also a big um level of you know maturity right 
Yes, yes. And I think too, where it's different with college classes, there's assignments and projects and things that I obviously can't excuse because that's a big part of the college class. Whereas I'm not a big homework giver in my K through 12 classes. I think you should have time to yourself when you get home to decompress, to participate in sports or activities or clubs, or just read a book or do something that you enjoy doing. You spent so much time at school that I really hate the idea of pushing more homework on people. So that's one of my big differences too. I can't help it at the college level. I have to give projects and homework, but at the K through 12, you're not really getting any homework from me. I wish I had you as a teacher now. <laughs> I love it. But um, I know you are very passionate about neurodiversity and you've been working around that uh, project for a couple of years. Like when people hear about neurodiversity, they're probably thinking about the brain, how the brain works. But what is specifically neurodiversity and how can we look out for it? Absolutely. That's a great question. I, I sometimes forget how often neurodiversity is a term that in my world gets thrown around a lot, but it's not something that everybody talks about. And so when you think of the word neurodiversity, think of it as an umbrella term that covers the term for autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, auditory processing disorder, sensory processing disorder, anything that falls into like my brain takes in information a little bit differently than someone who's neurotypical, that's neurodiversity. Um, so you don't, you can have all of those things, you can have one of those things, and you would be somebody who is considered being neurodiverse. So looking out for it, it's just a matter of being aware of what neurodiversity is. And if somebody talks about being ADHD, or they talk about being autistic, or they talk about having sensory processing needs that all fa falls under that neurodiversity umbrella Ooh, that's interesting I never knew that like like for me um I'm a big Grey's Anatomy fan and basically when watching that show I always became familiar with the brain and neural because of course if no one knew Derek Shepard is my favorite character so I'm like I have to know about neuro but I never knew you know but neurodiversity was a thing until I found out who like what you're working you got like neurodiversity is a thing like I never knew but like of course I knew what neuro was but neurodiversity is a kind of like the opposite of the neuro specifically because of course it's part of the brain but also it really kind of controls autistic ADHD and that sort of things which is absolutely crazy yeah, so just think of that word diversity as being just like any other time you would think of the word diversity, right? It just means different and, you know, and, and lots of differences because how the, even somebody who had, um, who is autistic, it's not the same person as the next person next to them who's autistic. We all, even ADHD, my type of ADHD isn't the exact same as the person who's ADHD next to me. There's always a spectrum to how it presents and how it looks because you've met one person with it doesn't mean that you've met everybody with it. And so that's that diversity piece. And I always like to tell people too, when you think of neurotypical and you think of neurodiversity, if you could weigh them on a scale, they would weigh the exact same. The difference is, is that we're in a world that is more conducive to the neurotypical than the neurodiversity. So that's why we feel those impacts a little bit more. But neurodiversity is just the way that your brain sees the world. It is taking it in information processing information, it's a little bit different. And that's why sometimes people who are neurodiverse struggle in school versus sometimes people who are neurodiverse don't struggle in school. But sometimes school, just the way learning is presented just doesn't work for how that person's brain takes in information and processes it. So it, it doesn't mean that you're not smart or you're not capable. It's just your brain has a unique way of taking in the world around you and understanding the world around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like with me, with, with a school setting, I'm the type of person that loves to get distracted easily, whether it's like me in school or getting distracted while I'm in class about like the work stuff I need to do. Like, okay, well, what do I have to do for the day? I'm so stressed. I do while I'm in class or grab my computer and pay attention going from back and forth. Like I'm the type of person that loves to like multitask and loves to get everything done. So I won't have to worry about it later and do what I need to do, whether it's like watching TV or hanging out with friends or, you know, doing something fun for myself so I work because I'm the person I loves to work. I'm like a workaholic per se. I'm 17 years old, which I hate. But it's like being a workaholic is not a bad thing. It's just the way my brain wants to work. Even though I want to see, like yesterday, I was watching TV, catching up on a couple of shows I was watching that I haven't watched since you know, like with work, it's always, you know, for you as well, I'm sure that it can really, you know, and with working so much, you can don't have time to watch TV or have time to relax. And I was sitting there watching TV. I'm thinking myself like, 
why not working? I'm bored. Like, why am I not working? But that's the same time. I'm like, why can't I watch TV and do anything about doing work? And that's a brain saying, okay, well, you need a break or you need a rest about doing some work. Which I'm the type of person that loves to work my butt off until I'm tired or I'm exhausted, which I absolutely hate. But I'm like, okay, well, that's how my brain wants to work, I guess. Like, I guess it's, you know, it's like my little ADHD that loves, you know, to make me work 24 seven, even though I don't want to work. I'm sure it's for you as well. It is very much like that. And I would say, I think oftentimes we're, we're hard on ourselves because we're like, I'm supposed to be relaxing right now, or I'm supposed to be doing it. And our, our brain wants to do all these things. And, and what I had to learn through my life is to be okay with that and to be forgiving. Like there's going to be moments where my brain is going to want to do all the things at all the times and that's okay. And then there's going to be times where my brain wants to do nothing at all. And that's also okay, because I feel like if you think about it, it kind of evens itself out from those times where I had to do all of the things at once versus the times where I'm just like in that paralysis and I don't want to do anything. So I, I think it's really important that people are kind of forgiving of their brain. It's like, hey, if your brain wants to multitask all these million things at one time and you can do it, then go ahead and do it because there's going to be moments where your brain is like, I'm good and I want to do nothing. And that's okay too, because I think oftentimes people who are ADHD, especially get those mixed messages of like, I'm lazy, or why am I not doing things? And then especially when we go through those moments of not doing anything at all, then we start to have those internal monologues of like, I'm okay, this I'm being lazy, and I'm not doing anything. And I, you know, I have the time right now. So I should be doing these things. But remember, like you just said, there's other times where your brain is doing all of the things all the time. And if you don't want to burn yourself out, because people with ADHD are prone to burnout, then those moments where you're like, I can't do anything, that's okay too. So you got to give yourself permission to be okay with the not doing anything and permission with the okay and doing all of the things and they'll even themselves out, but not beat yourself up, especially when you get to those moments where you're like, I can't do anything because that's your brain just resetting from the time that you made to do all the things. Yes, I love that. And like I said earlier, like you've been working on diversity, not neurodiversity for a while now. And I'm kind of curious, like with a person that suffers with mental health in various ways, like how does neurodiversity and mental health connect? Like does it connect in any way or any shape or form? That's a fantastic question. So yes. So I tell people all the time that I talk about both, not because they're mutually exclusive to one another. You can have one without the other. But oftentimes they go hand in hand. And I'll give you an example because this is the example I like to give. A lot of people who have ADHD also are impacted significantly by anxiety. And a lot of that is because as someone who's ADHD, your brain has this powerful ability to think of like five, there's one scenario, one thing that's given it in front of you, and your brain can think of 500 different ways that that one scenario could turn out. So you're an analytical thinker, your brain, that's why you need more processing time as somebody who's ADHD, because you are literally thinking through all the possible outcomes that could happen. And two, because your brain has the capacity to do that, it naturally is going to be be anxious right because you're going to be able to think about the way things could go wrong um and and in life inevitably you will have stuff that has gone wrong so that impacts you too and then so that's what helps kind of create that that anxiety and oftentimes anxiety can sometimes mask adhd especially in girls we think of you know if you're adhd you always hear the joke of being late all the time like you have this time blindness and then you don't get on time to things but then there's people who are adhd who get to time to get to things on time just fine and some of that is that anxiety that anxiety masks that adhd and that's what gets you to that thing on time and so oftentimes sometimes people will go missed or not get diagnosed because that anxiety or that mental health piece can cover up that neurodiversity piece. So it's really important to have conversations either with providers or acknowledging to yourself, what is some going on? Like, am I getting to something because I'm anxious and that's why I'm getting there? Or am I getting to something because I don't have an issue with the neurodiversity piece? But often they go hand in hand with one another just because your brain is so capable of thinking through so many different scenarios. And let's be honest, some of the scenarios are going to be anxiety inducing, like, oh, what if dreadful types of scenarios, but it's kind of how we frame our thinking around those that help us kind of overcome that anxiety piece. I never knew that. Like, that's insane. Like, I never knew like ADHD and anxiety really kind of align to how you really can cause it. Like, because with me, anxiety, like, I really always think about the worst case scenario, about everything whatever it's like my work why am I this interview not going well why my podcast not doing well or 
this inner like gun over thing about like this thing I shouldn't be worrying about at the same exact time because I'm with me I'm a very much oh, an overthinker about every single thing like I don't know why but it's always been a way I am growing up I hate that's the thing I hate about why like why you know I live every single day is like why am I overthinking about this summit or why am I overthinking about this podcast like this is a part of way of life but at the same time I'm like Maybe it's just neurodiversity that maybe coming into my brain at a small minute. It's really kind of going crazy. Or how can I really just, you know, have those resources to really, you know, prevent that overthinking and having those mindset overthinking from preventing to happen? And that's why it's so important that I'm glad you asked that question. And that's why it's so important to understand how things like anxiety and depression can manifest with, you know, being autistic or having ADHD, because those are things that can be incredibly impactful to you as as an individual and things that, like you said, it does impact you. You don't necessarily understand that that is what's happening to you on a day-to-day basis. And then, you know, life happens. We all have had something that didn't go our way or, you know, was bad news. And as somebody who's ADHD, you really get that, like you work in concrete facts and experiences. So if you've had a bad experience, it creates this bias in you that lets you know, like, okay, this bad thing happened to me. So a bad thing could happen to me. And so when you're thinking through all those like analytical ways of how the scenario could turn out, you're realistic that, you know, it it could be bad, but what we have to stop. And I have to tell some of the people who I work with on ADHD is how many times do you want to stress out about something? Do you want to stress out about something once? Or do you want to stress out about something twice? Because if you allow that anxiety to let you stress out about it, and it may or may not ever happen, then you have stressed out about it twice. You stressed out about it while you were thinking about it possibly happening. And you've stressed out about it when it actually happens. When if you could just kind of let go a little bit, and I know it's hard, it's so much easier said than done with anxiety. But if you let go of that anxiety a little bit and go, you know what? I will stress over it when I get there. You know, it's kind of like, you know, cross that bridge when I get there. I will stress over it when I get there because then I only have to stress over it once instead of twice because sometimes we stress over things that may never even happen, but we put all this time, this energy, and this focus, and this anxiety into a situation that doesn't even happen. Mm -hmm. And I am actually one of those people that dealt with things. I'm not going to be afraid of women. Like seriously, like sometimes I'll be stressed over something that oh, that is shouldn't be stressed out about. Like whether it's like assignment or whatever I getting uh, um submitted, I'm like, why is this stressing over this assignment? Even though like this is not that hard, like why am I stressing? But you know, like like how would you know you are on season five of blocks, which <laughs> I seen and it's so good. Like how would you describe your experience on season five of blocks? Oh, I love, I, I am a blockser for life. Um, season five was such an incredible experience. I went out to Kansas city. I got to work with Wes Bergman who, uh, for people who are familiar with Wes Bergman, he was on, uh, the real world back in the early two thousands. He's on MTV's the challenge all the time. In fact, actually one of the challenges that was just on CBS recently, he was on, on that and he could not be a better mentor and support. I'm really, really great for the time I was on season five I was really fortunate that I was a second runner up and I got invited to come back and play again and it's not out yet I think it comes out in a couple of months but I was on season 10 of the blocks Mm -hmm. and I was a second runner up on season five but I did even better on season 10 even though I can't say yet how I did so but if I did better than second runner up on season 10 I think that that shares how I did but I I was on season 10 as well and I loved going back anytime I'm invited to go back to the blocks I will go again and um, just the opportunity to meet other entrepreneurs, the opportunity to have conversations like how you and I are having right now comes up all the time when I'm speaking with entrepreneurs. I don't think people realize how much entrepreneurs tend to fall into the neurodiversity category because you have to have that level of creativity and drive and think outside of the box when you have your own business. So many times uh, entrepreneurs end up being neurodiverse. And then I end up having conversations just like this with them because they didn't realize how a lot of the things that they experienced in their life connected to that neurodiversity and that mental health piece. And as you can tell, I love having conversations like this. This is where I get really Really nerdy about the brain and neurodiversity. Oh, I know. I literally say, like, whenever someone asks me to go on their podcast or talk about like a TV show or something or an actor I like or something, I literally will talk for hours about it. I'm yeah. I'm literally so serious. And also, from what you just said earlier, I'm afraid you're probably going to be the first runner up. 
how that feeling you, <laughs> you can't say I literally had that feeling so I have to watch it when I release this but like did you ever watch the show or even heard it before before um going on it so I did watch the show before going on it, but I wasn't aware of it. It was so funny. It was one of those mornings where I don't know if you do this, but I tend to like lay in bed and we'll scroll through social media. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> so I, it was one of those kind of mornings that I'm scrolling through and I saw this, this ad for, are you an entrepreneur? Uh, do you want to be on a television show? And I applied and it was, again, I'm laying in bed. I just woke up. Do you know what I mean? So it was kind of like, I didn't, I don't know that I even gave it my A game. I was just kind of like, yeah, to all the questions. And the next thing I know, I was going through different rounds. You know, you it's kind of like a an impromptu video kind of interview answering questions and then eventually if you make it through all that you end up on the phone with either Wes or one of the casting directors and I ended up on the phone with the casting director and when I came it came back that I got accepted to be on the show I was very shocked I always feel like I'm not that type of person in my life like where things like that happen to me mm -hmm. so it was very much a surprise and really exciting and like I said I've I've gone on the show twice now. I've worked one-on-one -on -one, um, in like a smaller group setting with Wes, like I, as a mentor. And he, like I said, very knowledgeable guy. It's so funny. You think of him as like real world MCV challenge, kind of like meathead type of kind of guy, but he's not. I mean, he, I can't express how incredibly intelligent and smart, especially in the world of business, Wes Bergman is. And so having the opportunity to work with him, be on the show, be part of the Blocks family is something that I will forever be totally indebted to him for. Ooh, like there's little, not a lot of people that are in business, especially on TV, that's not so genuine. Like not everyone's so genuine in this business, but it's, it's great to see that you get to experience someone that's on TV with business and a bunch of things to be really just nice and willing to talk to you and mentor you with their busy schedule, which is something you don't see that often. No, and especially if you follow him on that in that world, he definitely has like a TV persona, which mm -hmm. I'm sure he killed me for saying this, but he couldn't be a more genuine, nicer guy. I really am grateful to know him. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like for, before we head off, um, I, I want to ask you from your te experience in teaching, what do you think really causes youth mental health? Because study has shown that 1.5 million more children are struggling with anxiety or depression, which I never knew, which started before the pandemic. Like, what do you think really caused, you know, pressure anxiety in our youth before the pandemic? Because, of course, with the pandemic, it really caused more anxiety and pressure like never before. So what do you think really causes, you know, teeth and youth anxiety or depression? I have two theories, and I put those theories into two different camps because I think that they have two very different places that they come from. The first is, I think, environmental. You know, the pandemic obviously caused a lot of stressors for people in their home environments, in their life, in school. Um, some stu younger students didn't really get to learn how to be a student in the school setting. You know, we kind of were abruptly taken out of school, put back into school. Um, so I think that there is environmental factors. And then depending on how susceptible you are to dealing with mental health, like do you have a family history of anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, you know, uh, bipolar, then I think sometimes what those environmental factors can do is they can almost be triggers that bring some of those things out in people. So they could have been dormant and now life events or environmental events have triggered these mental health that are essentially genetic or family. You know, they could have been dormant. Maybe, you know, the events of their life have brought it out, but that's what we're seeing more and more of. And I think that too, like, it's a perfect storm of different things. If you think about what social media does to your brain as far as like, everyone thinks that everyone's living this great influencer lifestyle right but you hear from celebrities all the time like selena gomez and and taylor swift how even you would think they are they're the pinnacle of being at the top of success right but they still deal with mental health need because there's still stressors and pressure that they have to deal with even as somebody who's kind of at the top of their game so i don't think we realize how much social media and technology and kind of oversharing of news and world things really impact people's mental health on a day-to-day -day basis. So kind of those environmental factors and then any kind of like sub genetic things I think are one camp. Then I think there's a whole nother camp and this is kind of more my, um, people might disagree with me, but I work with families a lot. I've worked for family with families for a very long time and you just start to see patterns over and over again, especially if you're someone who's neurodiverse, you tend to pick up on patterns, you recognize patterns. And one of the things that I have noticed is 
we're very much more aware of mental health than we've ever been in the past, which is fantastic. We should be more aware of mental health than we've ever been. But I think there are some youth who who misinterpret the feelings of what, you know, anxiety or depression feels like or versus what it means to not want to have to do something that you have to do. Like those feelings get mixed up a little. I mean, let's let's face it. We all have mornings where we have to get up or we have to go to a job or do a task that none of us want to do. But what happens oftentimes is I, I find that a lot of young people will misinterpret those feelings as anxiety and depression and or our suicide ideation. And they'll say things to like their parents, like, you can't make me go and do this or else I'm going to hurt myself. And I, I'm a parent and I get it. If my child came to me and said they wanted to hurt themselves, that would scare me a lot because my child is one of the most important things to me in the entire world. And if they're hurting, I'm hurting. I don't want my child to hurt. So I think a lot of times then what parents do is they step in and they try to prevent their child from feeling yucky feelings. I mean, let's face it, life is going to be filled with moments of yucky feelings. They're going to be filled with moments of fantastic feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, our goal is maybe live here and have moments up here in the sunshine, but there's going to be moments where we're going to have to deal with yucky feelings. And I think that a lot of times parents step in and they try to prevent their child from having to feel some of those yucky feelings. And then what happens over time is that child does not develop perseverance and resiliency skills. And then anytime they're faced with something that they don't want to do or they don't like, their parent steps in and makes it so that they don't have to. And their parent steps in and, and makes it so that they don't have to feel with these, these feelings. And then what happens is life doesn't get any easier as you get older, right? Things become more challenging. You have breakups, you have bad news, you lose a job. And if you don't have those coping and resiliency skills, then you don't know how to mentally push past that and how to deal with it. And I have found a lot with some of the young people that I work with is that their parents have stepped in and not allowed them to gain those perseverance, perseverance and resiliency skills. And they they misinterpret it and go, well, I'm going to hurt myself if I had to do this. I don't know that they actually would hurt themselves. Not that I'm doubting it. I don't want anybody to ever do anything that would ever cause harm to themselves or others. I want everybody to feel good about themselves. But I think sometimes we take it too far because that's how we've learned to have to get out of some of those things that we don't want to do. And then our parents protect us again from those yucky feelings. And it's it's a hard, really hard road to navigate because obviously you don't want to not believe somebody and then they do something that would hurt themselves because obviously we don't want that to happen. But to some degree, we have to build up a resiliency to yucky feelings because that's just going to be life. And I, I think we've had too many parents out of love. And I do think it comes from a place of love and fear prevent their child from having some of those resiliency. And that's why we're seeing some of that rise in mental health. Yes, you're exactly right. But that's a little hands on because with mental health, it really can cause so many things. And it really, you know, hurts parents are seeing their kids do with mental health and they're feeling hurting themselves because it'll make them feel better. But I really want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it so much. I learned so much from you and everything you're doing is absolutely amazing. So I really appreciate you coming on and thank you everyone for listening to this episode. I, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode as much as I did and hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day. And thank you so much for coming on, Kristen. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate of course, it. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too.